Welcome to FaithWorks, the enlightening and empowering program that builds your faith to help you overcome every single challenge in this life. My name is Kaude Adeshoga. I'm your host. I want you to sit back, listen, and be blessed. God bless you. Amen? Fear nothing. Amen? Now, that's another proof that you trust God. Now, if we go back to Isaiah chapter 26, if you trust God, you will have peace. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. And he says, Thou will keep in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusted thee. Many times there's a lot of trouble in your head, but there's a peace in your heart. You still trust God. Many times there are questions in your head that you're trying to answer and you're wondering, oh goodness me, what do I do? But deep in your heart there's a calmness. That is because you trust God. Many times people say they trust God, but it's God who has the parameters by which he can say you trust him or you don't trust him. God is the one that knows whether he's deriving pleasure or not. And if he says if you have peace in your heart, it means you trust him, then you trust him. And people who don't have peace in their heart, you can talk all you want, it means you don't trust God. And people display lack of peace in so many ways. There are people who claim they trust God, they can't sleep. If you can't sleep and you're tossing toe and fro, it means you don't trust God. Some people, you know, people display worry in different forms. Some display worry, they eat so much. When they're, tr- when they're troubled, you see them eating. They wake up at 1 a.m., they go and look for what to eat. It's a sign of trouble. It's a sign that there's no trust in God in your heart. Some people, like I said earlier on, they just cannot sleep. They're tossing on the bed. They sleep one hour, they're awake. They sleep another 30 minutes, they're awake. And they can't sleep. They're finding it difficult to sleep. And some have to use pills to sleep. It simply means you don't trust God. God is not with you. You remember... Job was troubled before calamities came upon him. He was troubled. He says, I was afraid. He said, what I feared most has come upon me. And you could see him exhibiting fear, uh, sacrificing and sacrificing. Just, he said, I don't even know whether the trouble is coming from. He knew trouble was coming, but he couldn't pin what it was. So he was afraid. He was troubled. Some people display worry. You find some people, they are calculated. They are together. They are comported. When they put the, um, the pencil, they put it in the right place. They put the key in the right place. But when they're troubled, they put the key in the wrong place. You see, when you start doing that, it means the grace to trust God is no more on you. You put, say, why am I scattered? It's a proof that you're not trusting God. That peace gets you comported. That peace, I remember once I drove and I parked the car and I left the key and I knew I was disturbed. I knew, and God said, no, you didn't trust me. Because of this, 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 you need to let go of this so that you can put your trust in me. And then you see them doing such things. You find people, they, 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 they such scattered that nothing is together where they are. Some are driving, you see them take a wrong turn. say, why did you take the wrong turn? I was not thinking straight. It's because they don't trust God and they are not at peace. He will keep in perfect peace them whose mind is stayed on him. Why? Because they trust him. That perfect peace gets you together, brings you a calmness and makes you comported and makes you organized. When you say somebody I'm scattered, they don't trust God. There's nothing called somebody who is scattered and somebody who is organized. It is somebody who trusts God and is at peace and somebody who does not trust God and is not at peace. It's a minimum comportment required of everyone. But the peace of God is what determines whether that comportment will be in order or not. So if you trust God, you'll be calm. You'll be at peace. You'll be relaxed. you look in trouble. you look, you may not have money in your pocket. You look comfortable. You look rich. You look well-to-do. You look well-fed. You look fresh. You may not have slept for three days yet. You look fresh. Who say, you tell someone you don't have not slept for since day before you say, but you look you look like well rested. 
when you look somebody looking tired, early in the morning looking tired, they don't have peace because their trust is not in the Lord. Amen. Now, I want to go to another aspect, appreciably contemporary, in Proverbs chapter 3. We're back to it again. Proverbs chapter 3, and I'll read from verse 5. He says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge God, and he shall direct your path. Verse 7. Now, it still continues. We stopped at verse 6 because that's what we needed for that. But trusting God still continues to about 9. In verse 7, it says, Don't be wise in your own eyes. Meaning, let him have his way in your life, not your own way. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Eight, it shall be health to your navel and marrow to your bones. Verse 9 continues. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruit of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. So if you truly trust God, you will give to God. You will sow, you will give to the work of the Lord. It's a proof that you trust God. Now, in, if I back up to Psalm 62, verse 10, trust not in oppression and become not vain in robbery. If riches increases or increase, Set not your heart upon it. So if you trust God, you know, someone whose heart is set on riches cannot release from the riches because he's calculating what he would do with the riches. So, you know, I just make sales and have 25 million in my account or 100 million. Now for me to buy and, you know, increase my bands, I need 109 million. So that 100 million must not be touched. So with the 100 million, nobody can eat. With 100 million, everybody will manage because we're trying to raise 9 million. We're short of 9 million. Even 5,000 to feed is a problem. That man does not trust God. His mind is set on riches. And the Bible warns, do not set your mind on riches. It says, depart from evil. So it is evil to set your mind on riches. So what do you set your mind on? On God. Who can provide all that you need in life? Amen? Now, if we back up to the same Proverbs chapter 23 again, Proverbs chapter 3, and we'll go back again to verse 5, and it says in verse 9, Honor the Lord with your substance and the first fruits of all that increase. This can be interpreted in many ways, but what he's saying that consider God first in your increase. Let God be priority in your life when it comes to finances. He said, honor him first. Now, you can look at it in different ways. People have different perspectives on giving. Some call pastors thieves. Some say you don't need to pay a tithe. Some say you need to pay the tithe. Some say the tithe is for whatever it is you believe. But God is saying in his word, you know, people have divergent views on different things. God says marriage is between one man and a woman. Some believe marriage is between a man and a man. And some other believe marriage is between a woman and a woman. And they believe they are right. But the word of God is absolutely clear. That if you trust God, you will give to God. In Psalm 126, and I read Psalm 126. Um, I can read from verse 5, but I actually would love to read the whole of Psalm 126. Now, when the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like those in a dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter, and our tongue with singing. Then said they among the heathen, The Lord has done great things for us. The Lord truly has done great things for us, and that's why we are glad. Turn our situation again, O oh God. The way the streams of the south flow. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. 
He that goeth forth weeping, bearing precious seeds, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his shells with him. And in, there's a story there in 1 Kings 17 and about the widow of Zarephath and the prophet Elijah. Very contentious discussion. And there the widow gave her last to the prophet. And she was sustained all throughout the time of famine. And I guess that's why some people make statements. That if you don't give, this will happen. If you don't give, that will happen. But the summary of it is you only give to God because you trust him. If you don't trust him, you will not give to him. You hold back the money and consume it all on yourself. It's a proof that you trust God when you give to God because when you give to God, you, you, uh, you obstruct the rule of economics which helps you to define having more, to invest, to have more. But the Bible says that he that hath more shall reduce. And he shall give shall, that reduces shall have more. He said there is a poverty which is to have more than his need. And there is prosperity which is to release and to give. So in the world economic and in the world thinking, when you stockpile more, it helps you to build your empire. But God says, in my own economy, when you release, then I'll build your economy, I'll build your empire for you. So when you release, it shortchanges your ability to build naturally in the natural economy, but you believe God will step in and build for you. And in God stepping in, then it's a demonstration of your trust in God. So when you trust God, you give. Because no matter what, once you give to God, you have diminished in your natural capacity to increase. It's a standard procedure. When you, when you make profit and you keep all to yourself and you stop while and stop part, in the natural terms, you have increased your capacity to increase. But in the spiritual terms, you have reduced in your capacity to increase. So by giving to God, it's a demonstration of trust. So if you don't give, it means you don't trust God. Do you desire to live and operate God's way of doing things? Do you desire to understand how faith works? Fundamentals of Faith is a book written by Coyote Adishoga. It teaches in simple terms how to operate the God kind of faith that helps you overcome all hurdles of life. Fundamentals of Faith is available for purchase at Trem Bookshop Obani Koro Lagos and Bible Wonderland Stadium Suruleri Lagos. Get a copy today. It's simple and absolute and clear. Amen. Now we said in that same Proverbs chapter 3, we're going back again to it. Proverbs chapter 3. From verse 5, I believe um, the Lord is ministering to you in, um, with this message to help you trust him because in these times we're in, you must trust God because all natural abilities are diminishing everywhere except in a few industries. But most natural abilities or most people's way of getting by is diminishing. The COVID-19 has diminished it so much. And But if you trust God, it says that in verse 6, in all your ways, acknowledge him. Verse 5 says, don't depend on your understanding. Meaning if you trust God, you have a very liberal mind. And you will not depend on your obvious and natural way of solving any problem in life. Now, people have natural ways of solving. I'm not saying spiritual, natural ways of solving things. When you trust God, you will not depend on your natural ways of solving things. You will depend on God who can use any means to solve that thing. Now, you could depend on the ability of God inside of you or you will not depend on your own natural ability. There's a difference between depending on the investment and the gift of God inside of you 
and depending on your natural ability. I've been to a program and they were doing a decoration and they were experts of the decoration and something went wrong, they just couldn't solve it. They couldn't come to terms with what to do. They tried it in this work. They tried, and I'm not a decorator. I just go there and say, why don't you just do it this, this, this? They first looked at me, they did it, and it worked. Their natural abilities failed them, and they could not solve that crisis. But God solved it through a means that is not a natural, because I'm not a decorator, I'm not skilled in decoration, I'm not trained in decoration, but God solved it. So when you trust God, you must not depend on your natural ability to solve problems. Now, God can use your natural ability, but you must always say, oh, no problem. Uh, we know you're an expert driver. It doesn't matter. We'll drive the terrain. We've been driving for the past 35 years. On our record, we've gone through. No, 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 no. You must depend on God. Who can use that natural ability or use any other ability? except the divinely installed or gifts, which is inside of you, then you can put your confidence in that. And in many occasions, people's natural abilities have filled them. In Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse um, um, in 10, 11, it says, the race is not given to the swift. Now in a race, the person that runs fast should win. I've seen an Olympic race, and I saw the fastest person in front and before he got to the line, he developed muscle pull and fell. His swiftness failed him on the day he needed it most. He just started limping. He tried, he couldn't get to there, but he was leading. I can't remember which year. Whoever cares to can go and check the archives of the Olympics. It was number one he was reading, and he just developed muscle pull. Just before his natural ability failed him. So the race is not given to the swift, no battle to the strong, no bread to the wise of favor to men of skill. That means you can have the skill and be denied favor and still it will not work. But it is God who gives favor to the skillful, bread to the wise, who and, uh, uh, helps the strong to win and allows the swift to win. But it is not their natural ability. So when you trust God, you will not be depending on your, I know myself, uh, uh, it's not a, uh, I, I won the prize in writing. I was the first in it. I had A1 in this. I had A1. It will fail them. In this day and age, it will fail. God said natural abilities will collapse. He said the natural abilities that are submitted to God, then it will triumph. I have seen medical practitioners do a surgery. They came out and they said, congratulations. The surgery was successful. And the person died in the ICU. They didn't make it alive. Why? God did not, he didn't help them out. The natural ability was displayed, but it brought no proof, no result, no profit. I guess that doctor has so much confidence. Said, oh, no, no, this one, this one we've been doing for 30 something years. So it's a minor one. Congratulations. He said, you were successful. He was washing his hand. I said, yeah, and then waving, and then he just went out, the patient died. And so that um, natural ability is not to be relied on. Of course, nobody wants to go and meet a doctor who is not skillful. They want to meet a doctor who is skillful, but I guess the doctors now know better. When they say, we care, God heals. They've come to understand. It's not trust in their natural ability, but in God. Yet, you need that natural ability. Amen. And I'll, I'll go further in Psalm 37. Psalm 37. Then I read verse 5. He said, commit your way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Now, you have the way, you have the method, you have the mechanism to solve the crisis. His warning, still commit it to God. Don't depend on it. Then he shall bring it to pass. Meaning, if there's any crisis situation... And the means to solve it is there. And I've said it before. Even when you are taking drugs, don't just, oh, use the uh, so so and so. Yeah, no matter what, we clear it. Oh, I've seen people who use the drug and it didn't clear it. Why? God did not give the grace. Pray over the drug. I said, Lord, I commit this drug. I ask that you bless this drug. When so so and so, it's a malaria drug. It's proven it works. And I've seen people 
take such drugs and they died. And some it didn't work. They used drug one, drug two, drug four. Nothing worked. But when you pray and you commit, so when you trust God, you don't depend on natural things. You don't depend on it. Even when the natural things are foolproof, you must still trust God. And how you, you pray that Lord, as we're taking this drug, as a surgeon wants to go into the surgical room, he doesn't come and say, no, I'm the best surgeon in the world. No, 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 no. He might just face some calamities. He's still going to pray and say, Lord, help me to perform this surgery successfully. Then he's not relying on his gifts. He's depending on God to use his gift to solve that problem. So when you trust God, you will not just rely on your natural and your obvious ability of solving anything. You will always involve God whenever you are operating those gifts, either by prayer or from your utterances. It will be evidently clear that your trust and your confidence is not in those natural abilities. In Isaiah chapter 31, Isaiah chapter 31, and I'll read verse 1. Quite a lot of scriptures we want to look at here. Woe to them that go down to Egypt for help, and stay on horses and trust in chariots, because they are many, in horsemen, because they are very strong. But they look not unto the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord. You know, the book of Joshua, God told Joshua, wherever the souls of his foot tread upon, he has given to him as an inheritance. And Joshua defeated Jericho. That walled city, the walls came down with a shout. And as a military man, he slaughtered the men and took over the city. When it was time to face the next city called Ai, Joshua said, oh, we don't need that much army. <laughs> Just small boys. Ah, now he was beginning to trust in his sword. He was no longer trusting God. He said, Just bring a, just bring a few men. Oh, you don't need special forces. Just 3,000 is enough. That small eye. Oh, yeah, go. The Bible says, I smoothed them and defeated them. The Bible says, They fled before I. Joshua put ashes and sackcloth on and cried to God. Why? He was too dependent on his natural strength. On his natural abilities, he fell before I. Though there was sin in the camp, but that's still, that's still not enough. He fell before I. And that's what the psalmist said in Psalm 121. Many people read Psalm 121 and say, I'll lift up my eyes to the hills, from whence come my help, my help coming from the Lord which made heaven and earth. That's not how it reads. David, a military man who wrote Psalm 121, knows that any military oppression from the hill has advantage to any military operation in the valley. Meaning, if you're fighting an enemy and you're on the hill and the enemy is in the valley, most likely the one in the valley is going to lose because your weapons can go faster and hit them in the valley while it will be facing the force of gravity coming up to meet you on the hill. So the hill is an advantage in military warfare to somebody in the valley. Now, David, in writing Psalm 121, did he write it that way? He said, Will he said, he said, uh, I'll lift up my eyes to the hills. No, no, he said, Will I depend on the hills for military victory or on the valley for a defeat? He said, No, he said, My victory comes from God who made both the hill and the valley. That's how Psalm 121 reads. He said, My strength comes from God who is the maker of the hill and the valley. So, David is saying. You can be on the hill and I can be on the valley. If your confidence is on the hill, he said, I will defeat you. He said, but if I'm on the hill and you're in the valley, my confidence is not on the hill. It's on the God who made both the hill and the valley. Then, no wonder he lost no battle in his life. And you can understand. He said, I will trust God who maketh my hand to bend a, 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 a bow of steel. He's my, he's my maker. He's my strength. He's my redeemer. David never, never lost one battle in his entire life. Never. No nation stood up to David from the beginning of his life to the day of his death. He won. He demonstrated that name, the Lord of hosts, 
the conqueror of death, the conqueror of hell, the conqueror of life. And the name of God is inscribed on David. It's the name of the Lord of hosts. The God that can never and has never lost any battle. And the only man in life who never lost any battle in his life is a man who says, my confidence is in God. Who causes my hand to bend the bow of steel? It's not my confidence is in horses. No. That's why he said in Psalm 46, he said, God is my refuge, a very present help in trouble. Though the earth be removed and the mountains cast into the midst of the sea, he said, I will not fear. He said, there's a, there's a stream that makes glad the city of God. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. He said, the kingdoms rage, the heavens moved. He said, there is a, um, I'm trying to remember what he said, it sounds 46. But he now went on further. He said, he make it wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow, caught the bars, and that burned the chariots in the fire. Pharaoh depended on military might. He drowned in the Red Sea. The children of Israel didn't have much and they walked on the Red Sea. So it's not just the arsenal, it's God. There have been bombs dropped in World War II that are yet to detonate, still in places in the earth. They have not detonated. If God doesn't give them the grace, it will never. Let them drop a nuclear weapon in your bathroom. If God doesn't give the grace, it will not detonate. It will just remain there. And if they drop it, God gives them the grace. It's over for that nation. It is God, not your natural strength. Amen. The book of Amos chapter 6, and I read verse 1. Woe to them who are at ease in Zion, that trust in mountain of Samaria, which are named chief of the nations, to whom the house of Israel came. Woe to any man who is putting his confidence in natural things, mountains of Samaria, the hills of so so, so and so. No. Even, even in nations, if you look at nations who depend purely on oil for their life, they don't prosper in life. Their citizens don't excel. Check, it's not that the oil is, no, it's you don't depend on the fact that you have oil that you make it. No. And that's why you see nations that have no minerals, only human resources. You see them excelling, excelling, excelling. They have more money than the ones that have oil. Why? You don't depend on oil. You don't put your life on oil because we have oil. So now we are going to be okay. No, they won't be. They can't be okay because we have oil. Oil doesn't make a nation okay. It's God that makes a nation okay, not oil. I believe you have been blessed by that message. And I know your faith has been built up. And I know all those challenges in life are all going to fall before you in the mighty name of Jesus. I want you to know Hebrews 12 says Jesus is the author of and the finisher of our faith. You need him in this walk. And so if you're out there and you don't have Jesus in your life, I want you to say after me, say, Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you're the only begotten Son of God. Come into my life, be my Lord and my Savior. It's as simple as that. Displayed on the screen is diverse information on how you can interact and reach out to us. Take advantage of it, and I'll be expecting to hear from you. Till I come your way again same time next week, I want to tell you don't give up. Faith works. It's working and it will work in your life. God bless you.